Tenakoto Tefano o Ateroi Unitarians. Tenakoto na manheri. No mai, higher mai. Kitene hui topa o te atua. Tenakoto tenatato katoa. Welcome to all from near and far as usual to our Sunday virtual sanctuary. Each of us has no, have known people who have left an indelible mark on our lives. Last Sunday, the one who most influenced the course of my ministry died at the age of 90, John Shelby Spong, Jack to his family, friends, and clergy. I was 39 when I moved to the diocese of Newark, New Jersey as rector, which is what vicars are called in the Episcopal Church. Jack was my new bishop. I first became aware of him five years earlier when I read his recently published book, Into the Whirlwind, which looked at the future of the church. It was the beginning of my lifelong formation, seeking to be the kind of priest he was and seeking the church we both envisioned. I have to say that 32 years later, I'm not there yet, but I wouldn't be who I am today if he had not marked my soul by showing me the way. Much will be said or, and has been said and written about his life in the past week and what it meant for the church. In my musings this morning, I'll be much more personal as I make a withdrawal from my memory bank to give you a glimpse of how to use your life as well and meaningfully as Jack did. To do so will require, at a minimum, his courage and integrity. His epitaph should be his oft-repeated plea, live fully, love wastefully, and have the courage to be all that we can be in full authenticity. I offer the following words entitled Go Boldly by Gene Olson as a memorial to Jack, who knew no other way to go. These words could have been spoken specifically about him. May you be brave enough to expose your aching woundedness and reveal your vulnerability. May you speak your deepest truths, knowing that they will change as you do. May you sing the music within you, composing your own melody, playing your song with all your heart. May you draw, paint, sculpt, and show the world your vision. May you write letters, poetry, biographies, slogans, graffiti, the great novel, laying bare your words to love and hate. May you love even though your heart breaks again and again. And until the end of your days, may your life be filled with possibilities and courage. Now time to light our chalice. We all have two religions, the religion we talk about and the religion we live. May the light from this chalice guide us to make the difference between the two as small as possible. Our opening song 
is another version of what I want us to eventually know well. Oops. Uh, we shall be known by the company we keep. Well, I can see that our choir members uh, enjoyed that and were singing with gusto. Uh, <laughs> I could hear one of them in the back bedroom. Uh, it might be obvious why I chose that as our opening hymn, because I can be known by the company I kept in, Jack, in my relationship with Jack Spong. Okay. I have some things to say for the reading, which is from Jack, and it's a long reading, and, but I, I want you to bear with it if, if you can. But before that, let me just say, Jack wrote, by my count, 26 books over his life. Medi had a tagline, a bishop rethinks whatever the focus of the book was. He did not write them for theologians, but for people in the pews or outside the church door. His intent was to ch challenge outdated visions of what it meant to be Christian. He fought the battles of his and my time supporting the ordination of women priests and bishops, and the full inclusion of the LGBTQI community. He challenged the church hierarchy of which he was a part, patriarchy, fundamentalism and biblical literalism, moralism, and while he had a lifelong love affair with the Bible, he had no problem criticizing the sins of Scripture and condemning antiquated interpretations of it. Most importantly to me, he challenged the creeds, in particular the virgin birth, the trinity, and the bodily resurrection. Obviously, he was forming me to be your Unitarian minister. I've selected a portion of the epilogue from what he told me was his last book to which I reported, yeah, right. It was entitled Eternal Life, A New Vision Beyond Religion, Beyond Theism, Beyond Heaven and Hell as a summary of where he ended up in his journey. He would eventually write four more books. The last was published three years ago. Here is the, his kind of summation of where he came on his journey. The time has come to state my conclusions clearly. The attempt to place the issue of eternal life into a new context has been accomplished. I have walked through religion as the arena in which the human family has long sought answers. I have dismissed religion's two primary premises. First, that God is other, a supernatural being, who can do for me that which I cannot do for myself, a formulation that necessitated my gaining God's favor. And second, that self-conscious human life is alienated from the supernatural being and that overcoming this alienation with some form of atonement is necessary. In these two premises, we both as individuals and as a species invested our hope that life had ultimate meaning, clear purpose, and the possibility of eternity. These premises, however, could not be sustained as our knowledge expanded. The alternatives for human life were stark. We could refuse to admit that the premises underlying our religious systems were fatally flawed and live in denial. 
That pathway is always present in the world of religion. Failing that, we could acknowledge that religion has always been delusional, more about a search for security than a search for truth, and thus be willing to give it up, face the consequences, and deal with the fact that we are no more than accidental creatures in an accidental universe. We then must enter the religionless world of a new humanity. That is, when we are forced to conclude that purpose is what we give to life, meaning is what we invest in life, and hope is something beyond the gra- in something beyond the grave, is only the pious dream of the childhood of our human- humanity, a dream that we now must abandon in our new maturity. Many regard these working hypotheses as the only real alternatives to the mindless, irrational denials contained in fundamentalism. I have sought to sketch out a new possibility. It involves a paradigm shift of gargantuan proportions. It acknowledges both the grandeur and the potential of humanity. Ultimately, it drives us to a new definition of what life is and a redefinition of almost everything we have ever assumed about God. I arrived at these new concepts not by abandoning my religious convictions of yesterday, but by transcending them. I began to see God in a radically different way as part of the universal consciousness in which I shared. The journey I have taken to reach this point is, I believe, the journey we all must take. I hope I have charted it accurately. It is the uniquely human gift of knowledge and the incredible human power to think about and to explore the meaning of life that allow us to walk into these places where few of us have walked before to transcend the limits of our humanity and finally to touch that which is eternal. I can say that, at least for me, it was only when I began to see this journey simply as the next step in a human journey, a journey that began when consciousness finally broke into self-consciousness, that I could begin to embrace embrace the idea that religion was and is just a stage through which we had to pass. Our real delusion as human beings was not the content of religion. It was our assumption that in any religious tradition, we could arrive at life's final answers. We had to walk through the fear that abandoning that delusion produced before we could discover the clues that issued in a new human self-understanding. Our ultimate destiny was never to be religious human beings as we once thought. It was simply to be fully and totally human. To break up that rather heavy intellectual thing, I offer uh, this from the supplement of our Unitarian hymnal entitled, Where Do We Come From? If you read all those 26 books that Jack wrote and knew him as I knew him, you understand why he became, in the end, a mystic. And as surprising as it is to me, so did I. So I thought I would offer you my musings on my mentor, John Shelby Spong. In a letter to Robert Hooke in 1675, Isaac Newton wrote, if I have seen further It is by standing on the shoulders of giants. The phrase is understood to mean that if Newton had been able to discover more about the universe than others, 
then it was because he was working in the light of discoveries made by fellow scientists, either in his own time or earlier. I stand on the shoulders of John Shelby Spong, and he stood on the shoulders of John A.T. Robinson, an English New Testament scholar, author, and the Anglican Bishop of Woolwich, his friend and mentor. Robinson stood on the shoulders of great minds like Paul Tillich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and situational ethicist Joseph Fletcher when he published a highly controversial book in 1963 called Honest to God. The dominant theme of Honest to God is that having rejected the idea of God up there, modern secular people needed to recognize that the idea of God out there is also an outdated simplification of the nature of divinity. Rather, Christians should take their cue from the existential theology of Paul Tillich and consider God to be the ground of our being. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died in prison after being part of a plot to assassinate Hitler, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's notion of a religionless Christianity is also a major theme in the book. Robinson's interpretation of this phrase was controversial. Robinson claimed that secular people require a secular theology. That is, God's continuing revelation to humanity is one brought about in culture at large, not merely within the confines of religion or church. The book also introduced the idea of situational ethics to an English-speaking audience. Situational ethics takes into account the particular context of an act when evaluating it ethically, rather than judging it only according to absolute moral standards. People need to look to ideals of what is appropriate to guide them, rather than an unchanging universal code of conduct, such as biblical law as divine command. What was appropriate for Fletcher, Robinson, Spong, and me is love. Honest to God highly influenced Jack Spong's theology, and his books often expand on Robinson's themes. It was his compass on his life journey. While Jack was a great intellect, what I most appreciated about him was that he was a wounded healer. The first theology book I ever read, long before I thought of going to seminary, was one by Henry Nouwen, entitled Wounded Healer. For now, ministers must be willing to go beyond their professional role and leave themselves open as fellow human beings with the same wounds and suffering in the image of Christ. In other words, we heal from our own wounds. Now and warns, our service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart wounded by the suffering about which we speak. Thus, nothing can be written about ministry without a deeper understanding of the way in which ministers can make their own wounds available as a source of healing. Being a wounded healer starts with a deepening awareness of our own personal struggles and with receiving the empathy that we need, tender-hearted understanding and compassionate support from other people. Being filled with love ourselves, we can overflow with love to others so they know they are not alone. 
feeling our own sadness, anger, anxiety, and inadequacy, we can deeply empathize with the emotions of other people so they can articulate their experience and receive care. When I first met Jack, I was new to the diocese and I was in deep distress. My 15-year marriage to someone with a severe personality disorder had pushed me to the end of my rope. I went to see him in his office, where I learned he was sleeping in a camp cot in his office closet. The reason was he wasn't safe at home because his wife suffered from a severe mental illness involving paranoia. He certainly understood my predicament. I will never forget his empathy, compassion, and support. It would take two years for me to extract myself from the marriage. During that time, I had to endure being slandered in my small town by my wife, having townspeople going through my rubbish, having my children kidnapped by her to the other side of the country, and then accusing me of publicly abusing them. Through it all, and before her lies were all refuted, Jack provided practical and emotional support, constantly reaffirming his faith in my honesty and integrity. He also thought I wouldn't survive in the parish and began making provisions to keep me elsewhere in the diocese. When the parish remained solidly behind me through it all, he was pleasantly surprised. Jack was a hum, also a humble man. After his wife died, he was a single parent just as I was. He asked if I knew a clothes dryer had a lint trap and needed to be cleaned out regularly. He hadn't. Embarrassed and chagrined, he confessed that after several months, his dryer had caught fire. On one occasion, when I was hosting him at my home after his annual visitation to the parish, he asked about where my oldest daughter was. I told him she was in bed, ill. He went to the kitchen, made a bowl of soup, and carried it to her attic bedroom on the top floor. My favorite memory of Jack is his managing to crouch his tall frame to sit on her bed and spoon her soup while chatting with her like one of her close mates. One of the characteristics of a wounded healer is a willingness to be vulnerable. One of the ways Jack did that was by calling his clergy together four times a year for a teaching day to share with them portions of what he was writing at the time for their feedback. The issues he was confronting were highly controversial at the time, and the traditionalists amongst us were, outra were outraged that he was pr proposing to make the church religion less. They were no less scandalized by his views that the Bible was not the word of God, but a human creation. He had a way of absorbing their outrage and making them powerless without returning outrage in kind. He did not blame them for their blindness, but chose to love them without giving an inch of his own convictions. I am in awe that he was able to do it for 21 years as their bishop without becoming cynical or vindictive. This week I've been overwhelmed by memories like the kerfuffle he stirred up internationally, nationally, in the diocese and in my parish by ordaining the first openly gay man as priest his strong support for Barbara Harris to be the first woman elected as bishop, 
was not appreciated by the rest of the Anglican communion, except maybe here in New Zealand. I would eventually leave the diocese to help care for my aging parents. But then being in a very conservative diocese, I had to be Jack's voice, saying to a new congregation that church must be changed to be of any use. I presented his ideas about rescuing the Bible from fundamentalism to a packed auditorium in the community with the loudest protest with the loudest press to protesters outside the door. I was in California's Bible Belt. I would not see Jack again until 2007 when I played a role in his making his second visit to New Zealand. My helping to host Jack and his wife Christine, whom I had known as his diocesan administrator, gave us an opportunity to reflect on our ministries and how we had managed the controversies that had surrounded them. When I sat at dinner with him on his last night here, I thought about the Episcopal Church before and after Jack and how they were two different entities. For that matter, so am I. Those changes would not have happened without one person willing to be a wounded healer with honesty, integrity, and courage. Rest in peace, my dear friend, knowing that your vision for us to live fully, love wastefully, and be courageously authentic has sprouted, but is not yet fully realized. That is for the next generation, but you have given them shoulders to stand on. I've chosen another hymn from our supplement called We Are, for our closing hymn. I thought that hymn captured his summary uh, rather well. And now it is time to extinguish our chalice we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I will move to our closing words. They're by Susan Seal. Much of ministry is a benediction, a speaking well of each other and the world, a speaking well of what we value, honesty, love, forgiveness, trust, courage, a speaking well of our efforts, a speaking well of our dreams. This is how we celebrate life, through speaking well of it living the benediction and becoming, as a word, well-spoken. And now for our conversation starter. You can go anywhere you want, but here's a suggestion. Whose shoulders do you stand on? What indelible mark has it left? Whose shoulders do you stand on? What indelible marks has it left? Because we all have shoulders that we stand on to see further.